Hello Year 7 and welcome back to our live stream lessons on The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. This is our second live stream, which means we are going to be reading chapter 2 of the book. Thank you so, so much to everyone that has been getting in touch, that has been sending in their work. It's been so lovely to see and I really hope that you guys are enjoying this book as much as I am enjoying reading it with you. Please don't forget, after we've read this chapter, you've got a spelling test to do. That's up on Show My Homework. You know the words. That'll be fantastic. So I want to start today with a little summary of chapter one, just to remind ourselves of what we read last time. We met four siblings called Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy. Peter is the eldest, Lucy is the youngest and the other two fit in the middle. Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy have been evacuated to the countryside during World War II. They have been sent to stay in an enormous and mostly empty house. The only other people that live there are the professor that owns the house, a housekeeper and a few servants. There's not very much for them to do in this place. They are quite bored. There is no Instagram. There are no Xboxes. There's no Fortnite. They've got a wireless radio, remember? But other than that, their only entertainment is pretty much just exploring the house. One day, whilst exploring the house, the youngest one, Lucy, discovers an enormous wardrobe. She climbs into it and discovers herself in the middle of a snowy wood. And suddenly, she meets a fawn, a half-man, half-goat. The fawn is surprised to see her, and there the chapter ends. So, are you sitting comfortably? Let's have a look at chapter two, what Lucy found there. Good evening, said Lucy. But the fawn was so busy picking up his parcels that at first he did not reply. When he had finished, he made her a little bow. Good evening, good evening, said the fawn. Excuse me, I don't want to be inquisitive, but should I be right in thinking that you are a daughter of Eve? My name's Lucy, said she, not quite understanding him. But you are, forgive me, you are what they call a girl, asked the fawn. Of course I'm a girl, said Lucy. You are in fact human. Of course I'm human, said Lucy, still a little puzzled. To be sure, to be sure, said the fawn. How stupid of me. But I've never seen a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve before. I am delighted. That is to say, and then he stopped, as if he had been going to say something he had not intended, but had remembered in time. Delighted, delighted, he went on. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Tumnus. I am very pleased to meet you, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. And may I ask, O oh Lucy, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tumnus, how you have come into Narnia? Narnia? What's that? said Lucy. This is the land of Narnia, said the fawn, where we are now. All that lies between the lamppost and the great castle of Herr Paravel on the eastern sea. And you, you have come from the wild woods of the west. I, I got in through the wardrobe in the spare room, said Lucy. Ah, said Mr. Tumnus, in a rather melancholy voice. If only I had worked harder at geography when I was a little fawn, I should no doubt know all about these strange countries. It is too late now. But they aren't countries at all, said Lucy, almost laughing. It's only just back there. At least, I'm not sure. It is summer there. Meanwhile, said Mr Tumnus, it is winter in Narnia and has been for ever so long and we shall both catch cold if we stand here talking in the snow. Daughter of Eve, from the far land of Spare Oom, where eternal summer reigns around the bright city of Wardrobe, how would it be if you came and had tea with me? Thank you very much, Mr Tumnus, said Lucy. But I was wondering whether I ought to be getting back. It's only just round the corner, said the fawn, and there'll be a roaring fire and toast and sardines and cake. Well, it's very kind of you, said Lucy, but I shan't be able to stay long. If you will take my arm, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tumnus, I shall be able to hold the umbrella over both of us. That's the way. Now, 
off we go. And so Lucy found herself walking through the wood, arm in arm with this strange creature, as if they had known one another all their lives. They had not gone far before they came to a place where the ground became rough and there were rocks all about and little hills up and little hills down. At the bottom of one small valley, Mr Tumnus turned suddenly aside as if he were going to walk straight into an unusually large rock. But at the last moment, Lucy found he was leading her into the entrance of a cave. As soon as they were inside, she found herself blinking in the light of a wood fire. Then Mr Tumnus stooped down and took a flaming piece of wood out of the fire with a neat little pair of tongs, and he lit a lamp. Now we shan't be long, he said, and immediately put a kettle on. Lucy thought she had never been in a nicer place. It was a little, dry, clean cave of reddish stone, with a carpet on the floor and two little chairs. One for me and one for a friend, said Mr Tumnus, and a table and a dresser and a mantelpiece over the fire, and above that, a picture of an old fawn with a grey beard. In one corner, there was a bedroom, which Lucy thought must be Mr Tumnus's bedroom, and on one wall was a shelf full of books. Lucy looked at these while he was setting out the tea things. They had titles like The Life and Letters of Silenus, or Nymphs and Their Ways, or Men, Monks and Gamekeepers, A Study in Popular Legend, or Is Man a Myth? Now, daughter of Eve, said the fawn, and really it was a wonderful tea. There was a nice brown egg, lightly boiled for each of them, and then sardines on toast, and then buttered toast, and then toast with honey, and then a sugar-topped cake. And when Lucy was tired of eating, the fawn began to talk. He had wonderful tales to tell of life in the forest. He told about the midnight dances, and how the nymphs who lived in the wells and the dryads who lived in the trees came out to dance with the fawns about long hunting parties after the milk-white stag who would give you wishes if you caught him, about feasting and treasure-seeking with the wild red dwarves in deep mines and caverns far below the forest floor, and then about summer, when the woods were green and old Salinas on his fat donkey would come to visit them, and sometimes Bacchus himself, and then the streams would run with wine instead of water, and the whole forest would give itself up to jollification for weeks on end. Not that it isn't always winter now, he added gloomily. Then, to cheer himself up, he took out from its case on the dresser a strange little flute that looked as if it were made of straw, and began to play. And the tune he played made Lucy want to cry and laugh and dance and go to sleep all at the same time. It must have been hours later when she shook herself and said, Oh, Mr Tumnus, I'm so sorry to stop you, and I do love that tune. But really, I must go home. I only meant to stay for a few minutes. It's no good now, you know, said the fawn, laying down his flute and shaking his head at her very sorrowfully. No good, said Lucy, jumping up and feeling rather frightened. What do you mean? I've got to go home at once. The others will be wondering what has happened to me. But a moment later she asked, Mr Tomness, whatever is the matter? for the fawn's brown eyes had filled with tears. And then the tears began trickling down his cheeks, and soon they were running off the end of his nose, and at last he covered his face with his hands and began to howl. Mr Tumnus, Mr Tumnus, said Lucy in great distress. Don't, don't. What is the matter? Aren't you well? Dear Mr Tumnus, do tell me what's wrong. But the fawn continued sobbing as if his heart would break. And even when Lucy went over and put her arms round him and lent him her handkerchief, he didn't stop. He merely took the handkerchief and kept on using it, wringing it out with both hands whenever it got too wet to be any more use. So that presently Lucy was standing in a damp patch. Mr. Tumnus, called Lucy in his ear, shaking him. Do stop. Stop it at once. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. A great big fawn like you. What on earth are you crying about? Oh, 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 sobbed Mr Tumnus. I'm crying because I'm such a bad fawn. I don't think you're a bad fawn at all, said Lucy. I think you're a very good fawn. You're the nicest fawn I've ever met. Oh, oh, 
You wouldn't say that if you knew, replied Mr. Tumnus between his sobs. No, I'm a bad fawn. I don't suppose there ever was a worse fawn since the beginning of the world. But what have you done? asked Lucy. My old father now, said Mr. Tumnus. That's his picture over the mantelpiece. He would never have done a thing like this. A thing like what? said Lucy. Like what I've done, said the fawn, taken service under the white witch. That's what I am. I'm in the pay of the white witch. The white witch? Who is she? Why, it is she who has got all Narnia under her thumb. It's she that makes it always winter, always winter, and never Christmas. Think of that. How awful, said Lucy. But what does she pay you for? Oh, that's the worst of it, said Mr. Tomnus with a deep groan. I'm a kidnapper for her. That's what I am. Look at me, daughter of Eve. Would you believe that I'm the sort of fawn to meet a poor, innocent child in the wood, one that had never done me any harm, and pretend to be friendly with it, and invite it home to my cave, all for the sake of lulling it asleep and then handing it over to the white witch? No, said Lucy, I'm sure you wouldn't do anything of the sort. But I have, said the fawn. Well, said Lucy, rather slowly, for she wanted to be truthful and yet not be too hard, too cross on him. Well, that was pretty bad, but you're so sorry for it that I'm sure you'll never do it again. Daughter of Eve, don't you understand, said the fawn. It isn't something I have done. I'm doing it now, this very moment. What do you mean? cried Lucy, turning white. You are the child, said Mr. Tumnus. I had orders from the White Witch that if ever I saw a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve in the wood, I was to catch them and hand them over to her. And you are the first I ever met. And I pretended to be your friend and asked you to tea. And all the time I've been meaning to wait till you were asleep and then go and tell her. Oh, but you won't, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. You won't, will you? Indeed, indeed, you really mustn't. And if I don't, said he, beginning to cry again, she's sure to find out, and she'll have my tail cut off, and my horn sawn off, and my beard plucked out, and she'll wave her wand over my beautiful cloven hooves, and turn them into horrid solid hooves like a wretched horse's. And if she is extra and specially angry, she'll turn me into stone, and I shall be only a statue of a fawn in her horrible house, until the four thrones at Care Paravel are filled. And goodness knows when that will happen, or whether it will ever happen at all. I'm very sorry, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy, but please let me go home. Of course I will, said the fawn. Of course I've got to. I see that now. I hadn't known what humans were like before I met you. Of course I can't give you up to the witch, not now that I know you. But we must be off at once. I'll see you back to the lamppost. I suppose you can find your own way from there, back to spare oom and wardrobe. I'm sure I can, said Lucy. We must go as quietly as we can, said Mr. Tumnus. The whole wood is full of her spies. Even some of the trees are on her side. They both got up and left the tea things on the table. And Mr. Tumnus once more put up his umbrella and gave Lucy his arm. And they went out into the snow. The journey back was not at all like the journey to the fawn's cave. They stole along as quickly as they could without speaking a word, and Mr. Tumnus kept to the darkest places. Lucy was relieved when they reached the lamppost again. Do you know your way from here, daughter of Eve? said Tumnus. Lucy looked very hard between the trees and could just see in the distance a patch of light that looked like daylight. Yes, she said, I can see the wardrobe door. Then be off home as quick as you can, said the fawn. And can you ever forgive me for what I meant to do? Why, of course I can, said Lucy, shaking him heartily by the hand. And I do hope you won't get into dreadful trouble on my account. Farewell, daughter of Eve, said he. Perhaps I may keep the handkerchief? Rather, said Lucy. 
and then ran towards the far off patch of daylight as quickly as her legs would carry her. And presently, instead of rough branches brushing past her, she felt coats. And instead of crunching snow under her feet, she felt wooden boards. And all at once, she found herself jumping out of the wardrobe into the same empty room from which the whole adventure had started. She shut the wardrobe door tightly behind her and looked around, panting for breath. It was still raining and she could hear the voices of the others in the passage. I'm here, she shouted. I'm here. I've come back. I'm all right. There we go. Chapter two, guys. So a couple of questions just to round off our reading from that. Please do remember, all of these are up on YouTube and I do put my PowerPoints up as PDFs to show my homework. So if at any point you want to go back and you want to do some more listening or you just want to read through the story, you can do that whenever you want. I don't actually want you to submit anything to me on to show my homework other than your spelling test. I just want you to take some time to think about these questions, to think about what we've read and to make sure that you do really understand what's going on. So my questions for you at the end of this lesson. Number one, do you think Lucy was right to forgive Mr. Tumnus? Think about what it is he tried to do to her. Think about how sorry he was. But do you think forgiveness was the right thing there? And now that Lucy's back, Lucy's gone to Narnia, she's come back and she's about to talk to her siblings. Do you think they will believe her story? Why? Why not? Would you believe your little sister if she came back and said that she'd found all of this in the wardrobe? Now, you lot, go to show my homework. Do your spelling test if you haven't already done it. I'm sure you'll absolutely smash it. And finally, you're still awesome. You really are, year seven. I hope you're all keeping well. Please, please take care of yourselves. Have a lovely rest of your day. Bye-bye.